Your presence in your presence.
nosso povo How did I start to believe You weren't sufficient for me Why do I talk myself out of seeing miracles Let's surrender to Him, Amen
tonight, God. Lord, you're so awesome. You're so good. Father, we thank you. We honor you tonight. Man, the theme of our conference, finish the fight. Man, what a powerful, powerful word and phrase for the time that we live in today. And as I, as I thought about that phrase and that theme, finish the fight, I can't help but to think about the, the life that you and I live today. About the battles that you and I are going to go through in life. How many know it's not going to be an easy walk? It's not going to be an easy road. There's going to be a lot of bumps and bruises along the way. And the things that you and I experience that are to come in life. Let me tell you something. You're going to need to believe in something bigger than yourself. Because the things that come, that are going to come in life, require more than power. It's going to require more than money. It's going to require more than just having the right people on your corner. It's going to require you to believe in somebody greater, somebody, somebody bigger, somebody stronger than yourself. And all throughout his life, Joshua was a man who walked with God and he believed that whenever, whatever he encountered, that whatever he encountered wasn't as big as the God that he served. And so I'm reminded of some moments in his life and I want to share, with, uh, share them with you tonight. I'm reminded of some moments where he's crossing the Jordan River with the rest of the Israelites. And now Moses had passed and now God told him, hey, listen, it's your turn to lead the people to the promised land. And so he takes him to the edge of the river. He says, this is what I want you to do. And to a lot of people, it might have looked impossible. Maybe there were some people in that group that are like you and I. He said, are you sure, Lord? And I love how God speaks to us sometimes. He's like, look, you dummy. <laughs> Listen, yeah, it might look impossible to you. And we say, well, Lord, the river might be a little too rough for me. I don't... I don't know how to swim. He said, that's okay, because I didn't call you to swim. I just called you to trust. That's it. And so Joshua leads him down, and, and as soon as the feet of those carrying the ark touched the water, it began to stop. It slowed down. Then they encountered another situation. After the river, they encountered another situation, another moment. It's the walls of Jericho, the, the city of Jericho. And God is telling Joshua, listen, you're going to have the city. It's already a promise to you, but you still have to do something. You're still going to have to fight. You're still going to have to walk. But the battle that I'm going to have you fight is not like the one that you think. In fact, it has nothing to do with swords and spears. What I want you to do is I want you to march and praise. I want you to march and praise. That's all I want you to do. And I can picture Joshua like you and I at that time scratching their head like, Lord, are you sure? Because my guys are ready. We're here to slice some ears and peel some faces. And you know, how many know that when we serve the Lord, sometimes they don't even make sense. He asks us to do things that are illogical to us. Joshua's there looking over the plan and coming up with a strategy to take over this city. God says, that's cute. I'm glad you came up with your own plan. That's awesome. But this is how we're going to fight this battle. Because I need to remind you, I need to remind you that this battle is not yours. It's mine. And so this is how we're going to fight this battle with praise and marching. And then Joshua encounters one more moment right after that. A few neighboring kings hear about what's going on and they, they get scared and they're like, look, we got to team up because they're going to be after us next. And so they team up to overcome Joshua and the Israelites. And once again, God does something that only God can do. Another move of God. And God says, listen, do not be afraid. I handed them to you. But you still got to fight. You can't just sit there. You still got to move. You still got to do something. And I love this whole movement and the whole thing that we see in Joshua's life because Joshua is never sitting down. He's always moving. He's always advancing. He's always moving forward. But over and over again, listen to me, God was demonstrating to Joshua something that he quickly understood. And it's something that you and I, we have to take hold of and hold on to and constantly remind ourselves if we're going to finish the fight. And that's this, that we cannot overcome or accomplish what lies ahead of us without complete dependence on God. 
And so this is the confidence. This is the confidence in Joshua's life. He was confident in his God. Time after time, moment after moment, God was showing Joshua, if you would just trust me, it'll be okay. This confidence that Joshua had in God is like no other. But it didn't start when Joshua took over as a leader. Joshua's confidence in God didn't start at the river. It didn't start as he marched around Jericho. He didn't say, Lord, when you open up the doors for me, then I'll get serious about you. He, he didn't say, Lord, if, if you were just pour out these finances in my account, then I can serve you. He didn't say, Lord, if you were just, I, I need to be in a relationship. I'm a little lonely. If you just give me a boo, we'll serve you together. No, listen, his preparation for these moments in life began early. In Exodus 33, we see Moses, he met with God in the tent and Joshua was with him. But once Moses left the tent, scripture says that Joshua stayed in the tent. He stayed in the presence of God. Scripture says that Joshua would not move out of the tent. See, for Joshua started with his time in the tent, lingering in the presence of God. And so what that, that tells me is, listen, the battles of life, the battles of life that you and I are going to face are won before we even step on the battlefield. The battles that you and I are going to face are won before we even step on the battlefield. If we can just learn to just quiet our, our voice and listen to the voice of God. All across this place, can we just close our eyes and lift our hands? Can we just pray to the Lord as we open up our service tonight? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God, Lord, for being so good to us, God, that time and time and time again, Father, you show us, you demonstrate to us, Lord, that we don't have anything to worry about, God, that we don't have anything to fear because we have the greatest person on our side, and that's you, God. Lord, we thank you for going before us, God. We thank you for walking beside us, Lord, and covering over us, God, as we enter the life's battles, Father. Lord, I pray right now, Father, that you would just begin to help us to understand, to understand, Lord, that the battles of life are won before we even step on the battlefield. Lord, that we would have a deeper, more intimate relationship with you, Father, where, where people can't see it. Lord, it's in the secret place. Where we're just vulnerable with you, an all-knowing God. Where we can just be transparent before you, God. And so, Lord, we thank you for the supernatural strength and covering and confidence that you give us, Lord. As we march forward, as we understand that your ways are higher than ours and your thoughts are higher than ours, God. Lord, that we would understand, Father, that as long as we hold on to you, that we're going to be able to finish this fight, God. And so, Lord, we thank you for tonight, for all you're doing the rest of the week. In Jesus' name we pray. And the whole church said, amen and amen. Give the Lord some praise. Come on. Amen. Come on. Why don't you turn to somebody, give them a high five, make your way back to your seat. Come on. Welcome to our second night of our Reeds Conference. Amen. Welcome to Reach Conference 2023. Finish the fight. You don't want to miss a moment this week. Get here early. Doors will open nightly at 6.30 p.m. and worship starts at 7. Make sure your kids attend Reach Kids Conference. 
Check-in begins nightly at 6.30. Morning session check-in starts at 9.30 a.m. Please make sure to pick up your children promptly after each service. Our first breakout is on Thursday morning. It's a leadership development discussion with some of our REACH network pastors. If you are in leadership, want to be in leadership, or want to hear from some of our network pastors, this is for you. During our Friday morning breakout, we will be talking about what it takes to keep fighting for our families with Pastor Jonathan Brzozog. Our morning sessions begin at 10 a.m. Join us for prayer before each service. Prayer will be held right here in the main ballroom at 6 p.m. nightly and at 9.30 a.m. before the Thursday and Friday morning session. Check out our merch booth in the lobby before and after each service. We have limited edition conference tees, sweatshirts, and shorts. Thursday is merch night, so get your items early. We love our network community and would like to see your viewpoint of conference. Tag us on your pictures or stories at The Reach Network, and you might see yours shared on our socials. Thank you for joining us for our Reach Conference. Follow us on social media at Reach Network and subscribe to our YouTube channel to be notified every time we go live. We hope to see you for our next service. When you had the leukemia, you were still preaching, right? I would tell you before I got cancer, the fire has a different meaning. I always live a normal life, I would say. So I said, ah, my testimony is boring, but when I <laughs> got cancer, then I was in a real fight. I had seen God in my life in a way that I'd never seen it before. I was angry at times, disappointed and frustrated and all kind of feelings. God helped me to overcome that. It was a crazy process, but I learned a lot. I know God has a purpose. I couldn't see it at the beginning, but now I see it. <laughs> we all have different fights in our life, and until we are faced with the fight, we will grow the way God wants us to grow. You would never be better if you never have a fight. I remember I told my wife one day, I said, the only way I'm going to become a pastor is if God sells me to be a pastor. But I was thinking, that's impossible. So when, when I met with Pastor Eddie, and he says, the only condition I have for you guys to be part of our ministry is that you have to be the pastor. I'm like, oh my God, how am I going to do this? As the time was by, I started changing a lot of things that the Hispanic culture doesn't do, like lights. If you go to any typical Hispanic church, they don't have lights. I started changing that. You have to be a certain age to serve a church. All those things that I had started implementing in my church, they start changing things. And I said, one of the reasons I'm gonna do it is because I wanna keep our youth. And the only way we're gonna leave them is we make an environment so they can feel comfortable. I want to create a church which is a family church that the kids can serve, the young adults can serve, and we can serve. And we had changed the dynamic of the church. Now we have more resources, facilities, cameras, and all that. We have some of the young adults that serve all day long from 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Now we can work together. So now I feel that we are one church. One of the things that I always ask God is to give me courage. When I came to the United States, I was 18. I came from El Salvador, so when I came in, I didn't speak any English, and I didn't know anybody, so I felt like I was in a prison. I didn't know if I wanted to stay in this country, that I wanted to leave. As soon as I came in, I always was praying, you know, God, if this is the place I need to be. I need peace, and I need friends. One of our dear pastors, Pastor Elie Sardonia, he's in need of a miracle right now. He's fighting for his life in the hospital. The doctors are not giving him a great report right now, so he's in need of a miracle. How many of you would come together with me in agreement to pray for a miracle over Pastor Eliezer? When I first met Pastor Eddie, we clicked. One of the things that I like that he's bold. You know, he's not afraid of anything. He's been my mentor. Being a pastor is not easy, but we need support. We need to know that other people are going through the same thing you're going through. 
and being on the network, this is, I believe, one of the best things that can happen to any pastor. The support and the gathering together, the love for each other. Pastor Omar, the way he loves people, he loves his pastors, it's amazing. Even though it's being hard sometimes, I know that it's a God calling. And I said, the only way I'm gonna quit is I die. You know, it's not an option for me. It's not something that I wanted to do. It's something that God called me to do. When he was sick, I wanted him to relax. I used to tell him, Amy, you can take time off. You don't have to preach. No, so he was preaching from home after cancer for three years. I'm like, maybe you, you don't have to do it. He's like, no, oh, I want to do it. And that's amazing because people sometimes are healthy and they just complain for nothing. And looking at him, the way he looked, and want to be here and want to preach and want to reach out. It's amazing to see. You don't see a lot of leaders like that. He always wants to go more and more. When God has something for you, He always going to give you a way to accomplish it. It doesn't matter how hard it is, how long it takes. When something is for you, God is going to make a way. A lot of doors are going to be there, and God is going to open it for you. But you have to be ready for it. You know, I believe we all have the same capabilities, the same opportunity. All we need to do is work hard. If you have the calling, go for it. God will qualify you because he sees something that we can't see. It's not easy, but it's not impossible. Look at us. You have to trust God, and that's it. God will take care of the rest. stuff reach network hallelujah it feels good in this place amen well I'm, i've got the privilege tonight to receive the offering and uh i just want to throw a question out there you know how many how many of you us i'm gonna include myself would come to a service like this uh, and we're already prepared on exactly what we're gonna give we've already got our money separated uh, we've already got our check uh, written out or, or we've already got the amount that that we're gonna give and, and it's already it's already in, in your mind you know I, I, I I'm guilty of that I, I w my wife and I we got like 15 grandkids and then we got you know all of the kids in the church and uh, usually we'll we'll give them something and uh, uh, my wife is always uh, has the right amount, you know what I mean? Raised like the cheapskate, you know what? You, 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 need to, you need to up that up a little bit more. And, and so I, I usually listen to my wife, you know what I mean? She, uh, she's the giver uh, in the family. And don't get me wrong, I've sat here in conferences before and she goes, uh, uh, how much are you giving? And I told her and she gives a raised eyebrow and it was like, boy, you're finally hearing from God, amen. And, and, and so, you know, if you're here tonight and, and, uh, and if your wife or your husband are, is the more generous one, kind of listen to them on the amount because uh, I think they're the ones that's hearing from God. Amen. You know, like I said, my wife, she's the giver. Uh, you know, she's always uh, giving away, you know, um, my stuff. You know, I, I remember one day I was looking for my shoes. I was looking for my Stacy Adams and, uh, and I couldn't find them. I go, man, I'm looking all over for my brown Stacy's. Uh, she goes, man, you haven't worn those in, in three years. Uh, I, I already gave those away. And, and I said, man, I was going to wear them tonight. She goes, you haven't worn them in three years. So, uh, you know, I, I think I was, uh, I gave her a hard time about it. So uh, she went back to the thrift store where she had donated them and uh, bought them back. Bought them back. I like the way that mic I'm going to wear those one of these days. Take this off. Right now, yeah. that's fine. Yeah, that's fine. She, she's the, she's the giver. You know, I, I listen to her. You know, but when, when I look out at, at a conference setting like this, I think back and, and I remember. I, I, I believe it's like 1987 when uh, Pastor Michael Neville was giving on a Friday night, uh, uh, asking, "Has anybody felt the call of God uh, to preach the gospel?" And I remember I stood up, and, and I stood up to a, it was at the Pico Rivera Sports Arena, and there was a few people that were there, and they were with me from the church, and they go, well, you, you want a pioneer, you want a pastor of church? I said, no, I just want to preach the gospel. He goes, well, he's given a call to be a pastor. I go, I heard how many people got the call to preach the gospel. So anyway, I stood up because I wanted to preach the gospel, but nonetheless, I, I landed up uh, pioneering the church anyway. 
I, I remember there was a time when Pastor Omar asked me to go out uh, and, and to, to Pioneer Church, and uh, I think I turned him down a couple times. And then uh, there was one year where we were having a conference just like this. I told my wife, I go, you know what? Uh, uh, we're going to pray. We're going to fast. We're going to be there. We're going to take the weekend off, the whole week off. We're going to be there for every service. Uh, and I remember every, every message, my wife and I, we were weeping at the altar. I believe it was Tyrone Garay who was preaching, uh, how long are you going to keep Paul and Silas in the church? Uh, and, and I was sitting right next to Pastor Omar. You know when you're sitting next to somebody and somebody makes a good point, you know, you give them the high five or you elbow one another. Well, they made that good point. How long are you going to keep Paul and Silas in the church? I had already turned Pastor Omar down a couple times. So, you know, I didn't look at him. I don't want to make eye contact. So I was just looking at my shoes, the brown Stacey Adams that I used to have. And, and, but I, I, I do remember, you know, uh, answering that call. And I told him on that Friday, I, I go, I, I, think, I think we're ready to go if you still want us to go. And he go, I go, what do we do? And he goes, well, you wear a suit and I wear a suit and we'll announce you. I go, well, where am I going to go? I, I want to go to Albuquerque, New Mexico. He goes, why don't we try local first? And if you want to go later to Albuquerque, we'll send you. So anyway, we've been, we've been in Long Beach for 22 years. Uh, but, you know, my, my, uh, my, my whole point of all of that is the church in Paramount uh, got behind that work. They got behind that work, and man, they, they blessed us. Uh, ask Pastor Eddie, I think he remembers exactly how much it was, you know what I mean, because he called me the golden boy uh, when I went out. You know, I had air conditioning, central air, central heating. They gave us carpet, you know, they gave us a linoleum. Uh, but, you know, it was a bar. They turned it into a church. Uh, and, 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 you know, the whole point of all of this is that the church in Paramount uh, gave sacrificially. They gave, uh, I forgot to read my scripture, uh, give uh, and, and you will receive uh, and your gift will return you to you in full, pressed down, shaken together to make room for more, running over, poured out into your lap and the amount that you give uh, will determine the amount that you get back. Uh, so we're receiving an offering tonight uh, and, and I'm telling you, when I, when I gave, uh, God has given me back. Uh, God has blessed us with the church and with people that are in the church uh, and God is moving uh, and so you're here tonight, uh, amen, and, and you want to give into this work, uh, this conference that we're having tonight, uh, you're not only going to be giving to, to this, but to your children, to your grandchildren, who knows who's going to answer that call at the end of this week or the next conference, uh, so I want to pray, amen, and you can give, you can scan to give, uh, you can make out your checks to uh, the REACH Network, if, if anybody's still making those checks, the older generation, even those that have money, amen, uh, we're, we're, we'll, we'll take your money as well. Father, in the name of Jesus, I pray that your Holy Spirit uh, would move freely with the spirit of liberality in this place uh, right now. In the name of Jesus, uh, we come against that tight watch spirit that would hold back. Uh, and Father, right now, in Jesus' name, begin to pour out that spirit of liberality as we begin to give, uh, as we begin to give to this work uh, that you're doing, because except the Lord build the house, uh, the labor's in vain. But we know, God, that you're in this work uh, in Jesus' name. And all that agreed, shout it out to say... feet tonight I'm telling you the Holy Spirit is in this house how many have enjoyed the service so far it's been so tremendous the worship and I tell you that testimony and 
of that church report and all that the Lord did in Eleazar's life. God is the God of miracles. I said, God is the God of miracles today. And everything that the Lord is doing in this house is really a miracle. And the churches that have been planted, the work that's being done, and how many thank God, it's not finished yet. We, we still got work to do, right? Still lots of work to do, but I'm, I'm excited to be able to introduce our guest speaker, but he's not just guest, he's family. And we've seen God raise him up. Even within our church, he was the worship leader. He was the uh, uh, connect group leader. He was, uh, man, I don't know, the youth leader, uh, all of that. I mean, so many things that uh, he did. And uh, he's always pushing the envelope, always keeping me on my toes. And I, I remember he was the, one of the first guys that had this dyed hair. I go, what did you do, man, with this dyed hair? And he said, I'm reaching the youth, man. I'm reaching the youth. But I, I'm, I have the honor tonight uh, to introduce the pastor of Restoration Life, Pastor Eddie Vargas tonight. Wow. Come on, can somebody make some noise for Jesus tonight? Oh, I think we could get louder than that in this place for Jesus. He's good. He's so worthy. Wow. God bless you guys. You can take your seats. Such an honor. Such a tremendous honor to be here with my family, my church family. <laughs> You guys, man, that, that report of Pastor Eliezer and Marlene just wrecked me. And uh, I, I want to give where honors, you know, do. I want to thank Pastor Omar and, and Pastor Letty uh, for the opportunity to minister into our family and uh, for the incredible leadership that they are. Um, also, the, the network, you know, board. Uh, and the team that helped put this conference together. I, I, I'm, I'm privileged that you guys asked me to speak tonight. Y'all know that I wanted to just receive all week. And uh, I'm honored to be here. And um, um, Pastor Dave, Sister Esther, love you, honor you. <laughs> and uh, my wife. We celebrated 32 years of marriage this year, just in June. And uh, my kids that are sitting behind her, love you guys, honor you, thank you. And, and, and the network family, this is my family. And uh, man, it's so good to be here at this family homecoming and uh, just honored. And I love, I love this theme. I, I, love, I love what God has already done, uh, Pastor Mike just brought a tremendous word on the purpose of the fight last night. And uh, man, I'm excited about the rest of the week. Uh, um, I have an assignment that was given to me to minister tonight on, and I want to talk to you about that assignment. It's the assignment of tonight is preparing for the fight. Pastor Mike ministered last night on the purpose of the fight. Tonight, I want to talk to you on preparing for the fight. And uh, if I could just be brutally honest, what's special and what has always been special about this family of believers is, number one, the presence of God and the fully surrendered lives that serve in every church that is represented here tonight. And so if you're looking for a title for this message, I've entitled this message, uh, Sparring with Lions and Bears. Sparring with lions and bears. Now, I'm going to get to that a little bit later on because as I look at it, my assignment and the theme is finish the fight, it's so powerful be, to me because for the last 33 years of my Christianity and pursuing Jesus um, with my family and, and, and with our churches, I've, I've seen God, I've been privileged to see God do so many incredible miracles, not just in my personal life and in my family's life, but in the life of the church that I was birthed out of and, and, and the other churches that have been birthed out of our movement and lives all around our network. I've had the privilege of, seeing, of, of actively seeing 
when God moved with extravagant miracles. I've seen teenagers transformed by the power of God in youth conferences over the last 25 years. We've ministered in crusades around the world. We've been involved in church planning and church mergers and building leaders and seeing people chosen by God go after God's purpose no matter what the cost. And it's been an honor to witness all of that for the last 33, 34 years of my Christianity. But if I'm just being honest, Roxanne and I have also experienced the dark side of ministry. We've seen people confess their faith in Jesus, set free from their sin, from their addiction, from their bondage. We've seen people set free from their brokenness only to backslide back into that when times got difficult, when the fight got too difficult. We've been on the receiving side of people's opinions and critiques and slander. We felt the heartache of leaders who we loved, who we trained, who we've laid down our lives over and over again to serve for the cause of Christ. Leave and talk really bad about the people that have done nothing but love them. Make no mistake, Reach Conference, this is more than a fight. This is more than a brawl. This is the all-out war for the souls of those that we love and those that God has developed and trained us to reach. In Jude chapter 1, verse 3 through 4, the Bible says, Dear friends, I have dropped everything to write you about this life of salvation that we have in common. I have to write insisting, even begging, that you fight with everything that you have in you for this faith that has been entrusted to you, that has been entrusted to us as a gift to guard and to cherish. Can we just bow our heads tonight as we go before the Lord and we just continue to give God dominion in this place tonight? Heavenly Father, I thank you for every son, for every daughter, for every marriage, for every family, for every grandparent, for every teenager and every child that's in our kids' conference. Holy Spirit, I pray that you have dominion, that you would transform us and quicken us and equip us this week, that we would be trained to go back to our communities, to go back to our families, to go back to our teams, to go back to our churches, to go back to our jobs, to go back to our lives and fight this good fight of faith. Because you have rescued us for such a time as this. And you've entrusted this to us to steward and to guard and to protect and to proclaim. God, tonight to you and you alone will be all the glory in Jesus' name. And everyone said, can you give God another big hand of praise? So let's look at the fight tonight. Because in order to train for the fight, you got to understand the fight that you're training for. you got to understand what you're training for. If you don't understand what you're training for, you're going to lose the fight that you show up to fight in. And so the first thing that I want you to think about and the first thing that I need you to understand is that you and I have been called to be freedom fighters. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 1, the Bible says it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then... And do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. You see, if you're saved, you're born again. And some of you might be born again again, and that's all good. Because sometimes we got to get born again again. Like when I first started going to church in Hawthorne, every single altar call that Pastor Dave had, I rushed to the altar and gave my life to Jesus. I think I got born again again like 27 times or something like that. And Roxanne's like, you don't have to keep going to the altar. And I was like, but I feel like I'm going to hell if I don't go to the altar. So if you're born again, again, come on, give the Lord a shout of praise tonight. But you've been made brand new. You've been given a new life. You've been given his presence. You've been called to a new purpose. All things have passed away. You're a new creation. All things have become 
brand new. And when Jesus sets you free, he just didn't set you a little free. He sets you free indeed. From the moment you fully surrendered to the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross. It starts there, but it doesn't end there. That is the beginning of your fight. Because Jesus won your fight from the cross. And he gave you the victory from the cross. That's why we are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus who loved us. Now, we understand that we've been set free by the blood of Jesus. That we've been sanctified by the blood of Jesus. That we've been anointed by the blood of Jesus. That our sins have been washed away by the blood of Jesus. But hear me clearly. Your freedom is not God's to steward. It is yours to steward. It is yours to take care of. It is yours to build or yours to throw in the towel on. And what a lot of Christians can't seem to grasp for, for whatever reason is that we feel like when we give our lives to Jesus and we start pursuing Jesus, and yet we're born again and we're saved and we're serving God, that everything magically is going to be okay all on its own. As if we have no obligation to the stewardship of our freedoms. This is why the Bible is very clear that you and I are to work out our salvation with fear and trembling. It is not God's responsibility to keep you free. He already did that at the cross. It is your responsibility and my responsibility to put in the work to stay free and to mature and to grow as men and women of God. And so 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 16 says, Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. We've been set free by Jesus. Now we have to learn how to steward that freedom so that we don't go back to the vomit of our sin in which the heartache comes in, because that's the dark side. People that come in and have a counterfeit transformation really had a deformation because it was an emotional experience and not a work of the cross on their lives. Philippians 2.12 says, Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not, always, not, not, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Paul reminds Timothy that this is a brawl. And that Satan isn't just going to allow you to live in freedom. First Timothy chapter 6, verse 12. Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the life that lasts forever. You were chosen to receive it. You have spoken well about this life in front of many people. And so Paul's telling them that this is a fight that you have to fight. Why? Because if you belong to Jesus and if you've sought him, to serve him with all your heart, with all your mind, if you've determined to live in joy, peace, purpose, filled with his spirit, then you know what a battle this can be. We're not fighting for forgiveness of our sins or acceptance from God. We already have that. Somebody say amen. amen. But our spiritual fight is found in the stewardship of our freedom and in the pursuit of of God's call and purpose over our lives. And sometimes we think this feels really hard. What's wrong? Why, what's wrong with me? Why, why is this so hard? Why is it such, such a battle? Why is, you know, it seems like all hell's breaking against me. Nothing's wrong. In fact, everything is right. You're in a fight. You're in a fight. If you're not in a fight, then something's wrong. See, we got to think about this a little bit different. We think just because we serve God that we're exempt from all the trauma that takes place in this world. When in reality, Jesus made it very crystal clear that if they hate me, they're going to hate you. That if they persecute me, they're going to persecute you. That if they try to kill me, they're going to try to kill you. And I'm sending you guys out as lambs amongst wolves. And so we have to understand that if we are Christians... And, and beyond just having a personal relationship with Jesus, but if we are disciples, devoted followers of Jesus Christ, then make no mistake, God has you in a war, whether you like it or not. 
You are in the battle of a lifetime. And here's the kicker. It never ends. It doesn't stop. Right? You'll have mountaintop experiences. Well, you'll get a little bit of peace. A little bit of rest, right? You get a little bit of replenishment and refreshment in the, in, the, in, the, in, in, in the Lord. But then you're right back in the valley, right? Because if you're not fighting for your sanity or, 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 or your growth, you're fighting for your marriage. You're fighting for your children. You're fighting for your children's children. You're fighting for your church. You're fighting for your leadership. You're fighting for your community. You're in a fight. And so nothing's wrong. You're just in a fight. And we shouldn't be surprised that it's not easy all the time to pray. We shouldn't be surprised that it's not easy all the time to worship, to stay committed, and some days just to keep going. We shouldn't be surprised that it might be hard on Sunday morning to get get out of bed and make it to church sometimes. Sometimes we want to be a part of the cuddle ministry, and we have to fight through that. You know, it, it, it blows me away what people will use as an excuse not to come and worship God on the day that we assemble together as an army of the living God to fight for the souls of mankind and to be equipped to go back out into the world and do what we've been called to do. It may be hard at times to rejoice in affliction. It may be hard at times to praise the Lord, to cling to God's promises, even especially when all hell is breaking loose. But can I tell you, those are the times that you need to hold on the most. It's when times get most difficult. You see, as devoted followers of Jesus, we've been called by God to be discipled and to reach our communities with the love and the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the reach in our network. We also know that this calling on the church and everyone that leads or serves at whatever capacity will always be under a constant assault. And if you're a believer that's living like salt and light in your church or in your world or at your job or in your home, you will not go too far along without encountering obstacles and attacks and sometimes from those closest to you. They'll attack your integrity. They'll attack your character. They'll, they'll start blaming for the, the church And the call of God and the people in your church for why you're not around them as much. How you can go to church and you can be committed to the church, but you can't be committed to a party. Or you can't be committed to this. Or you can't be committed to that. And the reality is, is that moment that God took me out of this world to serve him. I'm in the world, but not serving the world. I have nothing in common with a lot of people out in my family outside of a biological relationship. And so the moment they start doing things that I believe are detrimental for my family, I get up and walk out because I care more about my testimony than I do what they think about me. And this causes conflict even in biological families. This is why God reminds us in his word to stay vigilant of the enemy schemes. In 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 8 and 9, the Bible says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Resist him by standing firm in the faith. Now, we understand that the devil's schemes are constant and effective, and his desire is to destroy your pursuit of all that God has for you. I'm sure there's probably a lot more people that should be at this conference for for whatever reason. Something happened where the enemy strategically planted something that has kept them from bringing their children to the children's conference. That has kept them from coming here and listening to the word that God is going to use someone to speak into their lives. Because God's got a word prepared for everyone in this room. If If our hearts and minds are open to receive whatever God has to say to us this week. And you may not always discern that or even acknowledge that, but if Satan is involved in any way, you'll know because he's a master at distracting you from your purpose. Satan will even bless you with a job on Sunday. Pastor, I haven't had a job for six months, and man, they give me this great paying job on Sunday. Would God do that, or would Satan do that? Because Satan has a way of blessing too. It's just counterfeit. And his blessing is used 
to distract you from God's will and purpose for your life. Man, I've been alone for such a long time, and, and this girl, man, she's got eyes on me. Is she saved? Nah, but she's fine. That's the devil right there. The devil will plant lies. The devil will plant deception and strategies that if you and I are not careful to discern, what we'll do is we'll start going through things as a Christian, as a leader, as a disciple, as a volunteer, as, as, as someone that serves in the body of Christ. And, and if we're not careful, when the devil plants these lies, when he plants these deceptions, when he plants these strategies, what ends up happening is we'll find ourselves blaming people, we'll blame leaders, we'll blame spouses, and even find fault with God's church that has so graciously helped us stay free. And we don't even recognize it. This fight is personal. It's a personal fight. It's spiritual. It's demonic. And it can be exhausting at times and sometimes feel impossible to win, especially when it involves people that we've laid our lives down to love, to disciple, and to do love with or to do life with. Some of the greatest heartache I've ever experienced in my Christianity has come from people that my wife and I have given everything to help serve God and see them walk away and go back into the darkness. And there's absolutely nothing that we can do about it because we're not their savior. We're not their God. We're not their redeemer. But we are a vessel that God used to bring them to him. But Satan has a way of, of distorting things. And so this is where church hurt comes. But do you know that you'll never find church hurt in the Bible? You'll never find church hurt in the Bible because it's not in there. It's, it's another strategy that the enemy made up to bring division in God's house. It's interesting. Other times when you look at Peter, Peter tells us that Satan comes against us like a roaring lion. He's loud and full of intimidation. And there are some people that are here tonight that the devil's roar has paralyzed you in fear. He roars through the persecution. He roars through almost uh, uh, uncontrollable temptation. He roars through failures and violations of holiness, making accusations against God. He roars through life's hardships and tries to convince wonderful people at times that they don't matter, that they're not valued, that they're alone, and that God is abandoned. And he roars when we lose, lose loved ones to sickness or people that, 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 that fail. We, he roars when our churches are struggling spiritually or emotionally or financially. He roars when a leader that we love falls and people turn away from Jesus on behalf of what transpired there. And Satan will never be content until he sees every believer utterly devoured, disabled, or detached away from God. That is his strategy. So what do we do? Well, we fight. We have to fight. But how? Well, here's where it gets real. Because as an obedient believer, you and I are to stand firm in the strength of the Lord. You and I are to be self-controlled in the spirit, as the Bible says, and to remain vigilant in order to resist the constant and unending attacks that the devil throws our way. However, in every area, in all area of our walk as believers, we are incapable of fighting this fight on our own strength. We are incapable and insufficient in our own resources to overcome the strategy and the deceits and the temptation of the devil. Therefore, you and I must put on what God has made available to us as we prepare to finish this fight this good fight of faith. And God has prepared wonderful things for us. Like what we find in Ephesians chapter 6, verse 11. He says, put on the full armor of God. So that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against authorities, 
against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you've done everything to stand, stand firm. He never said, hang in there, buddy. He said, stand firm with the belt buckled around your waist, the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in its place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all of this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God, and pray. Come on, Pentecostals. Pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. And with this in mind, be alert. And always keep on praying for all the Lord's people. James 4, 7, put it like this. Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. Then he will flee. But guess what? He's going to come back. Because being victorious in spiritual warfare really is simple. When we belong to Jesus and abide in his truth and rely on his sufficient grace, the enemy never has the final word over our lives. Only God does. Paul writes to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 15, 57. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. In Joshua 1, verse 9, I love how Hector unpacked this. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not tremble or be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you forever, wherever you go. We're not alone in anything we go through. And what I love about Joshua is when Joshua was scoping out Jericho and he was kind of coming up with an attack, you know, to come against Jericho because Jericho was undefeatable by any human standard. I mean, they didn't have bombs. They didn't have tanks. They didn't have missiles. They didn't have anything. They, they had, you know, swords and, and, and rocks and, and, and these are the most fortified walls, you know, uh, that, they, that they had to come against. And when Joshua comes, he, he comes in contact with an angel of the Lord and the angel of the Lord's sword is drawn. And you read the story. Joshua comes up to me and goes, hey, who are you for? Are you for us or for them? And so like Joshua was about to get it on. And he goes, who are you for? Are you for us and for them? And I love how the angel responded. He said, neither. Well, what do you mean neither? Neither. I'm not on their side and I'm not on your side. But if you want to beat them, you have to get with me. This isn't going to happen on your terms. This is going to happen on your wisdom, on your gifting, on your ability. The only way that this is going to happen, if you do it my way, God's way. And the only way you and I are going to stay free and fight from freedom, for freedom, and other lives is to get this thing out of our head that we can, we can bring our terms to the table with God and say, this is how I'm going to serve you. This is how I'm going to fulfill my destiny. This is how I want to pursue ministry. This is the only time I have allocated. Um, I don't have 10%, but I got 3% uh, uh, for the time. You, you know, I, I'm going to do it my way. And God's like, no, 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 no. You don't, you don't get to fight this war on your terms. Your terms got you messed up and locked up in sin. My terms set you free with my son from the cross. So if you want to live this life of freedom, you're going to have to get with me. Amen. So we're freedom fighter. Number two, discipleship is where we train for the fight. Discipleship is become an ugly term in the American church. And I don't know why, but people, for whatever reason, fear discipleship. And I think because it has a lot to do with accountability. And we're living in a, in a, in a society, in a culture where people don't want to be accountable for anything. And I, and I grew up in discipleship, being accountable for everything. In fact, I remember when I, when I first got married uh, to my beautiful wife, I, I, I sat with my pastors, and, and I knew what kind of a knucklehead I was. And I told Roxanne, I said, you see me say or do anything 
that would cause you to be afraid or to fear me backslide, you go to pastor. You tell him right away. I don't care if you tell him. You're not going to pay for it when you get home. I'm not going to come down on you. I, I, I'm going to honor the fact that you care about me enough to tell my pastor that he needs to call me, that he needs to talk to me, that he needs to check me, that he needs to rebuke me. And I have lived my life that way for the last 33 years. And guess what? I love the stewardship that accountability brings over my Christianity. Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11 through 14. So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and the teachers to equip his people for what? For works of service. So that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. And we need to know that this is a process. It doesn't just happen overnight. I know that you get to see chapter 33 of Eddie Vargas' life. But boy, do I wish you would have been able to see the introduction of my book. The first three chapters, the first three years. Man, it was brutal. And if I'm just being honest, it was because of my pride. It was because of my ego. It was because there was so much that, that, that needed to be purged out of my life. But in order to do that, I needed to fully surrender to God. And I think that we're living in a time where people don't understand what it looks like to fully surrender to Jesus. Not just on Sundays, but every single moment of every single day of our existence. Paul explains that God has equipped his people in the church with miraculous gifts and skills, but there seems to be a massive spiritual assault on discipleship and developing strong, unwavering Christians in the church today. Barna cites that only 28% of the local church in America is involved in discipleship. 28%. That's just over one in four U.S. Christians that go to Christian churches are being discipled. One in four. Another 28% are being discipled, but are not helping others grow closer to Christ. And a very small percent, percentage, less than 5% of men and women that have been discipled are discipling others. This is Barna's statistic. By these definitions, this means the plurality of Christians, 39%, are not engaged in discipleship in the Christian church in any direction. That means that close to 40%, almost half of our churches have people attending that are there to get a word. That are there to socialize. That are there to get their miracle. That are, that are there because it's good for them. It's good for their family. Have you ever heard this? Man, I love bringing my people. I love bringing my family to church. It's good for us. It's good for you. This is, I mean, I, 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 I get the idea. It's like going to the gym, good for you. I, as I've heard, I don't know. <laughs> I haven't been there in a long time. <laughs> but good for you. You, you. We don't go to church. We are the church. We, wherever we are, we are the church. And so, if if... If 39% of the church is there just for a word and not for discipleship, that's a serious problem that we need to address in our network because if we're not careful, that, can, that, that number can grow. So what do we do? Well, first we have to know that it is a spiritual fight that needs to be fought spiritually and not carnally. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3 and 5 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war, uh, we don't, we're not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not the flesh, they're not carnal, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. The primary battle we'll fight is not in the physical or the mental, it is in the realm of the spirit, which will in turn manifest as fruitful in the realm of the natural and in the realm of the psychological or the mind. But if you can't fight 
in the spiritual realm, you will always lose in the physical one. If you don't know how to engage the enemy in the spiritual, I promise you, he will hand you your rear end every single time you come in contact with them in this lifetime, especially when you're in ministry. Like, like you can't get involved in serving God by serving his people, by not engaging in the realm of the spirit and allowing the spirit to mature you spiritually because Satan has, has some pretty strong demonic things out there that are just licking their chops, waiting for you to step out on your own power, on your own ability, on your own gifting, not even recognizing that God isn't with you in this. Kind of like the seven sons of Sceva, who saw Paul and the men of God laying hands on demonically possessed people and setting them free. And they thought just because they heard them do it a certain way that they can go do that too. And they went and laid hands. And the Bible said that all these boys got their butts handed to them. They were stripped buck naked and kicked out of the house. Because they were like, Paul I know, Peter I know, Jesus I know, but who are you? I mean, if hell doesn't know who you are, you're in trouble. See, I believe that the attacks that are on our lives have much to do with who you might, who you might become in the future rather than who you've been in the past. Who you've been in the past is like all of us, knuckleheads, sinners, falling short of the glory of God, addicts, broken, jacked up, messed up. And then Jesus came into our life and set us free. And now he's deposited his Holy Spirit in us. He's baptized us in his gifts for the work of the building and the equipping of the church. And now we're church builders and we're laborers in the harvest field. And we're the type of Christians that reach network that will go into the ends of the earth to preach the gospel. We don't care what the fight looks like. We don't care how many are against us. God has revealed that there are more with us than they are against us in this battle. So you might be here tonight and you've come to this conference hoping to get a word from heaven that might help you navigate the valley that you're in. You might be here tonight and it seems like all hell is breaking loose on your family, your mental health, your children, your finances, your business, your careers. You might be here tonight and you're serving in the ministry, but, but you feel like you're getting tired, you're, you're getting exhausted, you're getting burnt out and you're leading teams and you're pastoring churches and you're trying to carry out the vision and you're maintaining your spiritual sanity and, and, and it almost seems delusional at times to keep up with the pace. You might be here tonight and, 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 and you're loving, but for whatever reason, you, you, you love to self-sabotage. And you go through these vicious cycles and you allow yourself to, to get back into bondages that Jesus set you free from and your leadership helped walk you through. Listen, freedom is messy. Freedom is messy. And what I love about the pastors and the leaders in this network is that these men and women are willing to walk through that mess with you until they see you set free. Unfortunately, there are a lot of people that aren't willing to allow themselves to be walked through that mess. And so maybe you've lost something in this fight of faith and you just can't seem to discern how you've arrived at this place and what you need to do to get back to the place of passion, what you need to do to get back to the place of surrender or, or worship or trust or absolute obedience to God's call and purpose over your lives. Listen, I want to encourage you tonight. Don't do what so many have done before you and simply walk out on God just because life or ministry, or relationships, and maybe even your purpose in Christ has gotten sidetracked, or dismantled, or put on hold. Don't throw in the towel. Don't you dare give up on God. He didn't give up on you when he was on the cross. He's not done with you. He's not done with any of us. My God, he's not done with me. And if he's not done with me, I'm sure he's not done with you. Colossians 1, 3, and 14 says, For he has 
rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the son that he loves in whom we have the redemption of the forgiveness of sins. He hasn't always, he hasn't always given you what you've wanted, but he's always given you what you've needed. God has never left your side in the midst of the struggles. He knows your weakness. He knows your failures. He knows what you go through. Jesus decided, knowing that he would face what he would face on the cross, he decided for the joy set before him that every life in this room was worthy of his sacrifice. That every life in this room was worthy of the pain and the shame that he would face. The Bible says for the joy set before him. His joy was your freedom, your redemption, your purpose, your healing, your restoration, and more importantly, your salvation was worth it to him. John 10, 18 says, no one takes my life from me. I give it up willingly. I have the power to give it up and the power to receive it back again, just as my father commanded me to do. And so I want to encourage you tonight, wherever you are, whatever you're going through, for whatever reason you're here tonight, Don't you dare trample the blood of Jesus underfoot. Don't you dare give up on the blood that was shed on the cross of Calvary to set you free. Just because you're having a bad day or a bad week or something didn't go your way. you got to learn how to stand firm on God's truth to wear that armor. Who told you to take it off in the first place? How many would say I'm ready to train? Come on, I'm ready to train. That means I'm ready to be discipled. This is the fight that we're in. It's a spiritual warfare. We get that. We we, we talk about this a lot. We talk about spiritual warfare a lot in this ministry because we recognize that you have to understand the fight and you have to understand the realm that you're warring in in order to navigate everything else that we do in life. Because when we come to something like this, and we get inspired, and we get equipped, make no mistake, we're picking a fight with the devil. In fact, I'm here to pick a fight tonight. I'm here to pick a fight, but it's not with people. I'm not here to pick a fight with people. I'm here to pick a fight with what's influencing you to do the things that you do. I'm here to pick a fight with the one that's lying to you, about your purpose and your calling in life, about the value and your identity in Christ. I'm here to pick a fight with that thing, that demonic thing that has no place in your life anymore. And if you won't fight for you, we'll fight for you until you're able to fight for you. And so I believe that we need to train and, and to unpack this. And, and I only got, gosh, not, not, not too much left. I, I believe that this might help some of us tonight, and it's found in the story of, of David and Goliath. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to go into much of of that story when it comes to what happens there. I think we all know what happens there, but let me just give you a little bit of context. The armies of the Philistines were on the mountains on one side. Um, they have invaded Judah. They've invaded the land, right? So, uh, a couple chapters back, Jonathan had already defeated the. The, the, the Philistines one time and then a couple chapters later we find ourselves in, in, this, in the book of Samuel and we, and we find ourselves in this, in this book and, 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 and the children of Israel are all, all geared up for war and the Philistines are, are, are all geared up for war and, and both armies are ready to attack each other when a giant by the name of Goliath steps into the valley between the armies. The Philistines proposed proposal was simple. We're going to send one warrior out and he's going to fight on our behalf and he's, you pick your warrior out and he'll fight on your behalf and whoever wins, the losing side and their families become slaves to the victorious. And what fascinates me about this story is not that one single man of Israel wouldn't volunteer to face down and fight Goliath. What I find fascinating in the story is that a teenage boy somewhere between the ages of 14 and 16 years of age by the name of David comes out of nowhere and he, and he, and he sees what's going on. You see, he had been back at home tending his father's sheep and his father, Jesse wanted to be a little chismoso and he sends him with some cheese and he says, Hey, go take some of this food to your brothers. Cause they're all at the fight right now. 
His brothers are warriors. His brothers are fighters. He says, take, take these things to the fight. Um, give your, your brothers some food because back then what, what would have to happen is that when, when the warriors were out fighting, the families would send food to the front lines. It's not like they always had a lot of food at the front lines. But one of the things that I find remarkable is that when Goliath shows up, what a lot of people don't understand about this fight is that the Philistines were trespassing on God's holy ground. And what a lot of you don't understand is anytime the enemy comes against you in your house, he's trespassing on holy ground. And the unfortunate thing that was taking place at this time is that for 40 days and for 40 nights, this giant warrior would come out day and night and taunt the children of Israel and prove their cowardice to the rest of the army. And I find it so amazing that King Saul, the one that was anointed by God, someone who stood head and shoulders above everybody else, the Bible said, when he was chosen, he was probably the prime candidate to go out and face Goliath from Gath, the Philistine warrior. And yet Saul hid in his tent and did not confront the giant even though the giant has trespassed on holy ground. There are too many men that are allowing the enemy to trespass on their family, trespass on their children, trespass on their calling, trespass on their anointing, and they're hiding in their tent, and they're not facing the giant. And hear me clearly. The giant you do not confront today will be breathing down your neck tomorrow morning. And Goliath is just coming out. Now, some scholars believe that when the children of Israel would go out and pray, they would pray in the morning and the night, kind of a lot like some of the Muslims do. The children of Israel would go out in the morning, they would pray, and they would go to their God, and then in the evening they would go to their God. And the Bible says, interestingly enough, that Goliath would come out twice a day. Some believe that he would come out during their time of prayer. The time that they were seeking God for wisdom. The time that they were seeking God for strength. The time that they were seeking God for grace, for mercy, for discernment. What do we do here? Is the very time that Goliath came out and said, come on, Red Rover, Red Rover. Send a warrior right over. And so Goliath was louder than God in their prayer life. The enemy has shut down their prayer life. 40 days, we know the number of testing, but then out of nowhere, this little kid comes and he arrives. And in 1 Samuel 17, 19 through 37, the Bible says, now Saul, now Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David arose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper and took the provisions and went. And as Jesse had commanded him, he came to the encampment and the host was going out with the battle line shouting the war cry. And, 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 and Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle, the army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper and the baggage and ran to the ranks and went to greet his brothers. So he left his sheep in good care. And as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath came out and said, came out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words before. And David heard them. And all the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, have you seen this man who's come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with the great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. In other words, you get the girl and no taxes for life. Come on, somebody. And David said to the men who stood by him, what shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that would defy the armies of the living God? You know what David was saying when he said uncircumcised? He said, this guy is not in covenant with our God. This guy doesn't have relationship with our God. We're all in covenant with God. We have the presence of God. We have the power of God. God is with us. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that think that he could talk to us like that? 15-year-old boy, basically going, who's this punk? Talking all that trash. 
And then they, the people answered to him and said, so it shall be done to the man who kills him. Now Eliab, his oldest, his eldest brother, heard when he had spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was killed, kindled against David, and he said, why have you come down, and with whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your presumption and the evil of your heart, for you have come down to see the battle. And David said, what have I done now? Was it not but a word? And he turned away from him and, and toward another and spoke in the same way. And the people answered him again as before. Now, before I move on, I have to give you this little nugget. Some of you may not know who Eliab is. Eliab is David's older brother. You read a couple chapters earlier. Samuel, the prophet, was ripping away, or God was ripping the king away from King Saul because King Saul had been disobedient to God. So God says, man, I'm, I regret making Saul king over Israel. Go to Jesse's house, and you're going to anoint a new king. So Samuel goes to Jesse's house, where David was out tending the sheep. And the first person that he runs up against is this great-looking, tall guy. And Samuel looks at him and goes, man, this, this has got to be the guy that's going to get anointed as king. He's good-looking. I mean, he's got to be the guy. And God speaks to Samuel and goes, man, don't look at the outside appearance. Man looks at the outside. I look at the heart. So Eliab was passed over. So when young David, who was anointed as king, shows up to the fight, guess who tries to discourage him? The one that wasn't anointed to do the work that David was called to do. Now I'm not going to say how many men in the church get like this. Or how many people in the church get like this? But it's an issue. What about me? I mean, I'm a warrior. I'm here. I'm going to fight. Man, you're just a little kid. You, you, you get out of here. Man, I love seeing young people serve God. I love seeing young people preach. I love young people, seeing young people lead. So that's why David's like, what have I done now? And where the word of the Lord, thank you. And where the word of the Lord... That's, that David spoke was heard, they repeated them before Saul, and he sent to him. And David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to him, you're not able to go against this Philistine and fight with him. You're but a youth, and he's been a man of war from his youth. So here's Saul, the king who isn't willing to fight, now telling David, you, 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 you can't do this, man. That's because Saul was functioning out of a place of carnality and not spirituality. Watch. This is my third point. And this is for everybody that's in this place. God will prepare you in secret places before he puts you in the palace of his purpose. And what most people didn't understand is David was prepared for this fight unlike anybody else. Here's what I've come to learn. That the most faithful and the most fruitful people in my life and in Scripture are the ones who know how to fight and win the battles that nobody else sees and nobody else knows about. Those are the men and women that have, that have had a strong testimony in my life. Growing up as a young disciple, and being an armor bearer to my pastor, Pastor David, and Pastor Esther, and then Pastor Omar, and Pastor Letty. I've gotten to know them in the secret places, and in the private places, and I've seen them do war in the private places before they stepped up on platforms to conquer giants. And the most powerful people in my life are the ones who are godly when nobody else is looking, are the ones who have character and integrity and pray and read their Bible and worship God regardless of a title or of an assignment. The only thing that they care about is that they please God first. David walked in the fields each day with his animals, with his sheep. David could not have known about the giant called Goliath that he would one day face. 
His only concern was to fulfill what he was responsible for. And I think that this is a discipline that so many disciples lack. The value of your responsibility. We all have responsibilities. Your husband, you're responsible for your family. Your wife, you're responsible for your family. Your children, you're responsible for your, for your actions. You're a leader in your church. You're responsible to steward that ministry with honor and excellence as unto the Lord. You have a responsibility to God. Somebody say amen. And so when Saul, so when Saul says to David, you can't do this. He's, he's been a warrior longer than you've been alive. Listen to the way David responds. Verse 34. But David said to Saul, your servant used to keep sheep for his father. And when there came a lion or a bear and took a lamb from the flock, I went after him and struck him and delivered him out of his mouth. And if he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant has struck down both the lion and the bears. And this uncircumcised Philistine shall be just like one of them. For he has defied the armies of the living God. And David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear will deliver me from the hand of the Philistine. And Saul said to David, go and the Lord be with you. David tells the king, man, I've sparred with lions and bears. My training camp was when a bear took one sheep, because you know, they usually only take one. When they took one, I ran after it and caught it. And if it came against me, I killed it with my bare hands. And when the bear came into my, 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 my pen or into, into my sheep fold and took one of my sheep, one of my dad's sheep, I was responsible for that sheep. So I left the 99 to go after the one because that was my responsibility to tend my father's sheep in my father's house. And what no one knew, not even David, is that one day God would anoint him for a future work, but developed him in a place where there was no applause, where there were no titles, where there were no platforms. He was developed in the secret place of the Most High God. And this is generally God's pattern for preparation. He calls us to be faithful right where we are and then uses our faithfulness to accomplish greater things. But if we can't be faithful in the little, rest assured, God will never have us do anything more. It's a responsibility that we have, an obligation. If David ran scared at the lion or the bear, he would have never been ready to fight Goliath. But he was faithful. He was faithful in the, in the secret place. And now we know he'll be faithful in the public place. Let me show you where this applies to every disciple in this room. Because you might be here tonight and you've been given a responsibility in your ministry. A responsibility in your church. How you steward that responsibility. How you lead that team. How you lead those volunteers. How you serve on that team. How you serve Jesus by serving his church. How you steward that responsibility will determine what God will allow you or bring you to next. But here's what I find. I find that a lot of young disciples want platform before they've proven themselves favor, favorable and faithful in the pastures of obscurity where nobody sees them. Listen, David learned how to be protective over his father's sheep. Kind of like Kind of like when we were being discipled in our church, we were trained and discipled to watch over the people in the church, to, dis to train the people in the church, to equip the people in the church, to love the people in the church, to pray for the people in the church. And if somebody in the church found themselves lost, we were supposed to leave the 99 and go after the one because we were honoring the vision of our spiritual father's house. We were not on the platform. We did not get the titles, but we were sheepdogs in God's house. 
And that's where God trained us in the little things. Ask any pastor that's been planted out. When we were serving in our home churches, we sparred with lions and bears. In fact, I can remember when my pastors told me to lay down on my sword when I wanted to do something so bad. And they're like, yeah, it's not for you to do. And I was like, a pastor? Like, I've been here enough for this. Yeah, it's not for you to do. I need you to lay down on your sword. What does that mean? That means I needed to die to my desire so that I can fill the vision of my pastor in his house. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Some of you leaders who want to be used by God need to learn how to fight for the one sheep that the lion is attacking, to learn how to fight for the one that the bear is assaulting. But if you cannot rest assured, God will never position you or place you in a responsibility that you'll run from when Goliath shows up. 2 Timothy 1.14 says, Guard the good deposit that was entrusted to you. Guard it with the help of the Holy Spirit who lives in you. We were faithful in the seemingly small mundane tasks like being like just showing up to church on time. Never calling in sick. Come on. We showed up. We stayed late. We loved hard. We laid down our lives. We have been transformed by the blood of Jesus and there was nothing that we would ever say no to God in. I mean, honestly, if God asks you to do something, is there anything that you would leave? Like, God, let me pray about that. Like, who are you praying to? Who are you praying to? God already spoke to your leader to speak to you. Because he's been trying to speak to you, but you won't listen. Being an armor bearer to our leaders. Ready in season and out of season to serve the church. Loving the broken fighting for revival, doing all we can to help take care of God's house, especially when nobody's looking and nobody's patting you on the back. I don't need a pat on the back to do what I do for God. All I need to hear one day is, well done, good and faithful servant. I don't need a title to preach the gospel. I don't need a title to pray for people. I don't need a title to love on people. I'm a Christian. I'm a minister of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is our calling. And we got to fight for this. That our character is formed in the trenches of everyday living and our hope in God is built in the daily battles of life. What David practiced daily in the trivial enabled him to succeed in the pivotal. This was a pivotal moment for Israel. David had rescued singular sheep from lions and bears. And now God was going to put him on a platform where he's going to have to take out Goliath. And he wasn't just rescuing one or two people. He's rescuing a nation now. He was entrusted with a nation. One day, as you are faithful in the little, some of you one day are going to go out to reach nations for Jesus. But you have to be willing to rescue the one. Hear me clearly. God does not anoint titles. He anoints people he'll use to fulfill the responsibility of the title. For Samuel 16, 13, the Bible says, Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brothers, and the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon David from that day forward, and Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. Now, it's interesting because after David's anointing as king, did he go to the palace? No. He went back to the pasture, not the throne. After his anointing, he went to go watch the sheep, not the courts of the palace. After his anointing, he went back to protecting the flock. After his anointing, he went back to the pasture to go write songs and to worship God and to hone his skills on that slingshot. After his anointing, he went back to the pasture to learn how to worship and be responsible over the little because God was going to call him into the much. What you do with the anointing in the pastures of life, in the obscurity of the hidden places, greatly determines what God does with you next. 
There are too many people in our churches that hear the lions roar and they run from the roar. I challenge you to run to the roar and fight the good fight of faith to finish this race. All right. I'm, I'm, I'm bringing this to a close. Is it okay? Fifth point. Be careful when people want you to wear what they won't fight in. 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 38. King Saul is like, all right, you're going to do this, kid. I'm going to take out this giant. Here's my armor. Put it on. Wear it. Go out and fight with it. Then Saul clothed David, in verse 38, with his military attire and put a bronze helmet on his head and outfitted him for, with armor. And David strapped on his sword and over his military attire and struggled at walking for he had not trained with the armor. So David said to Saul, I cannot go out with these because I've not trained with them. And David took them off. Listen, Christian, there are going to be times in your leadership, in your pastoralship, in your servanthood, that people want you to wear what they themselves would not wear to fight. They'll want you to do what they themselves would not do to fight. And David's like, I don't have any proof that what you're telling me is gonna help me win this fight. But I got this slingshot that I've dialed in in the wilderness and I've sparred with lions and bears and I've killed them and I've taken them out. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be no different than that lion and bear. So you keep your opinion, you keep your critique, you keep your armor, you keep your thing to yourself. I'm gonna fight with what God gave me to fight because this is proven. My hands have proven this weaponry. My hands have proven this Bible. My hands have proven this prayer life. My hands have proven this worship. My hands have proven as I, as I lay hands. These hands are proven. This slingshot's proven. You know what the problem with your armor is? Your armor is carnal. Your armor, you think your armor is going to protect you. My defense isn't in that armor. My defense is in the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. I'm going to go out with this slingshot. When you get to the biggest challenges of your life, you cannot afford to experiment with unproven weaponry that does not fit your situation. Be careful when you get around men and women that want you to suit up in their armor. When we try to use the armor of unspiritual people. Let me hear me clearly. Saul was already living in disobedience. Saul had already the spirit of the Lord ripped away from him. Saul was carrying in fear because God's presence was not with him. It was with David. And so when he said, use my armor, that was a carnal way of saying, here, maybe this will help you. But David knew, I'm in covenant with God. I don't have anything to fear. But David knew he was a man after God's own heart. And when we try to use armor of unspiritual people, we lose what could have been one with what God provided to kill lions and bears. Proven armor. Last one. We serve God's heart, not ours. You know, when I was looking at the story of, you know, the Bible says that David is a man after God's own heart, right? That's what the Bible says. God even said that about him. You're a man after my own heart. Saul had done two things wrong. Saul had gone into the temple and sacrificed. You could read a couple chapters earlier. He'd gone into the temple and sacrificed and done things that he wasn't supposed to do, that he wasn't anointed to do. But he was freaked out because everybody was leaving him. And so he went in and did it anyways. And he showed up on the scene and Samuel rebuked him because he did something that was dishonorable. He was just disobedient to God. In a lot of people's eyes, well, he was just taking initiative. In a lot of people's eyes, he was only doing what he thought he should do. But in God's eyes, he was being disobedient to his word. And so God says, I regret anointing him as king. And then you read a couple chapters later, he's going to go fight the Amalekites. And God tells him to kill the king, kill King Agag and everything and everyone. Like kill everything. And what ends up happening is Saul allows 
the king to live and, and the people rally up together to keep like the best cows, the best carne asada alive for the barbecue after conference, right? So he was like, and he was found disobedient again and Sammy has to show up. He goes, what have you done? What have you done? He's like, man, I've sacrificed. He goes, it's better to be obedient to sacrifice. And then you didn't kill the king and all these things. He goes, bring the king to me. And Samuel pulls the sword and chops this king to pieces and kills everybody. And then Saul rips his robe and, and, and Samuel says, today the kingdom is being ripped away from you. And so that, and then Saul begins to repent. I want, I, I want, you, to, I want you to hear something. Because Saul's repentance stated was stated by justifying his actions. Saul said to Samuel, I've sinned for I have transgressed the commandment of the Lord and of of your words because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Here's a king that feared what everybody else was saying before God. This happens a lot in church. What everybody's saying, maybe two people are saying, and you're part of those two people. You ever had somebody, hey, pastor, everybody's saying that they don't like the lights in here. They don't like, they didn't like that worship song. They didn't like all the kids up on the platform. Everybody's saying, eh, you're the one that's saying it. And maybe one or two other rebellious people that can't see what God is doing. And so Saul validates why he did what he did wrong. And his repentance, his repentance was like, don't, don't strip my title. Don't, don't strip my throne. Like, like honor me. Come back with me and, 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 and bless me in front of everyone because, because I, I, I'll fall down and I'll worship God. I'll do whatever he told me to do. But God had already stripped the kingdom away from him. And then when you look at David, now again, he didn't kill somebody and he sacrificed where he shouldn't have sacrificed. David, like when you look at David, like mature David, David has, has a, commits adultery with Bathsheba has a child, you know, uh, that dies, kills her husband to cover up his adultery. I mean, and then like all hell breaks loose in his house. And if you were put it on a scale, like who was worse? Saul who worshiped, who took initiative to worship and who didn't kill somebody that he should have killed. And David who committed adultery and killed a mighty man of valor and set up this premeditated murder and did all these other things. I mean, he's just shady. And yet, God strips the kingdom away from Saul and says that David is a man after my own heart. Like, what's the difference? You know what God revealed to me? The difference is, when Saul repented, he wanted to maintain his title and his authority and his expression in front of everyone because that's what mattered to him most. But to David, when David repented, He said, God, take not thy Holy Spirit away from me. Cast me not away from your presence, O Lord. That's the difference. And I think far too often in our churches, when people come to repent, they just don't want to be found out by the rest of the church. When people repent, they just don't want their titles or their ministries taken away. And it's not what it's all about. Because there'll be, you'll never be able to finish this fight without the presence of God. And the most important thing to every believer in this room as we stand to our feet is the very presence of God tonight. We cannot finish this fight without the presence of the power of the Holy Spirit. We need to be discipled and to train to finish this fight. But in order to do so, we're going to have to spar with some lions and some bears. We're going to have to get some things in order in our houses and in our homes and in our churches. But I'm here to encourage you tonight that God is not done with anybody in this building yet. Whatever God started in your life, he's going to finish in your life. And if you would say, Pastor, here I am. I want to train. I want to lay down my life. I want to give God my best. I want you to get out of your altar. I want you to come to this place. We're going to worship. We're going to pray. We're going to surrender. And we are going to give God our utmost best. Here am I, God. Here am I. Here am I, God. Here am I, God. Use me. God 
will lead us. Will direct us. Come on. All I need is a memory of a victory, like a stone and a sling. Every time that you fight for me. Help me pray. Come on, prayer warriors. Help me pray. Come on, pastors. Help me pray. Come on, if you're a prayer warrior, help me pray. Come on. You can do anything. Your grace, your might. You can do anything. Your grace, your might. You can do anything. Your grace. within me belongs to you. My heart, my mind, my soul. Not the desire of my heart, but the desire of your heart, God. That's what I serve. That's what I preach. That's what I live for, God. Have your way, Holy Spirit, in this place. Now pouring of your presence. the name. 
He's the name. Lift it up. Lift it up. It's your the name of Every head by every eye closed for just a moment. You're in this place tonight. And God has spoken to you about your assignment in this life. And the things that you've allowed to distract you or misdirect you or cause you to fall away from your yes to the Father. And today, you would renew that yes before God. And you would respond like Isaiah responded when God said, who will we send? And who will go for us? He would say, God, here am I. Send to me. Well, in order for you to be sent, you must be released. And in order for you to be released, many of you need to be restored. And if you're a leader here that has fallen, or you're a Christian that's here that has been lied by the enemy, and you said, you listened and heard and believed that you've done far too much to ever be used by God. I want you to know that the devil is a liar, that God is here to restore you, and that he can fulfill your purpose as long as you fully surrender to him to right now. And if that's you, would you raise your hand and say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I want to come back. I want to come back to the ministry. I want to come back to serving. I want to come back to accountability. I want to come back to my church. I want to come back to being an armor bearer. I want to come back to where my, my yes is a yes. And it's filled with honor. And it's filled with courage. And it's filled with integrity. And I don't care what they ask me to do. I don't care how minuscule the, the, the task may be. I'm going to give my God my best as I serve his bride. That's you. Raise your hand all the way up and let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, for every man and woman of God in this place who has been lied to by Satan, I rebuke that lie. I come against that lie. And Lord, we, we declare complete and utter truth of what your word says. God, I pray for restoration. I pray for healing. I pray for anointing, Father. I pray for their hearts to be lifted. No condemnation has come upon them. Lord, I pray right now in Jesus' name for complete freedom, that they would walk in the freedom and they would steward that freedom, that they would honor that freedom, that they would pursue that freedom passionately as they serve you by serving in their house. In Jesus' mighty name, and the church shall Amen. Come on.
message. God just keeps bringing the fire, did not he? Come on, let's give him some praise. Amen, amen. Listen, that was powerful, but listen, it doesn't stop. We're going to be back here tomorrow, 9.30 for prayer. 9.30 a.m. in the morning for prayer. Okay, then we're going to get our leadership panel here. Okay, right after that. But listen, we want to just well, we just want to remind you, please go get your kids. That does conclude our service. Go get your kids. Please go pick them up. God bless you, and we'll see you back here tomorrow, 9:30, and for our evening session again at 7 p.m. God bless you all.